All right, thank, thank you all for being here for this discussion. Um, this uh, conversation is really going to draw off of the uh, legal principles that Jeff was just going through in his last talk. Um, I know there are a few people that, that have come in, but essentially uh, we're talking about uh, and are, are really fortunate to have uh, Karen and Robert up here on stage, uh, who are plaintiffs in active litigation. It was filed in January of 2019. Um, so this case is pending. This has the ability to really uh, make law that um, uh, will clarify a lot of the issues that we talked about. So um, I, I think where I'd like to start, uh, Jeff, if, if this works for you, is I'd like to talk a little bit uh, to Karen and to Robert sort of about their stories and um, how they came to engage online with an Arkansas state senator named Jason Rapert. So we will I, hear all about that. Karen, why don't we start with you? I, I will reserve the right to object. Okay, okay. yeah. <laughs> I originally, uh, is this on? Yes. Good. Yep. A little, little closer. Uh, Jason Rapert does not represent my particular district in Arkansas, so he wasn't actually on my radar until somebody pointed him out to me. He does, however, vote and make laws regarding all Arkansans, so therefore he does represent me in the larger capacity. I was interested, so I went to his website, having uh, not, not his website, his Facebook, his official Senator Jason Rapert Facebook account, and in all honesty, I was shocked at how he promoted his Christian values in this forum. So I began to engage with him, and I actually didn't get very far. Uh, <laughs> I, Let, let's, let's be specific. What did, what did you post on the uh, Facebook page? I can read it to you. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> okay. And I want to go through this word for word because I, I want you all to see, right, the kind of thoughtful and polite and engaged uh, activism that we see from, from Karen and Robert when we're, we're thinking about these as First Amendment issues. I think understanding, because you're going you're gonna to read these court opinions when they come out. I'm going to talk about them on my show. And sometimes, as, as you know, the facts get distorted. So, Karen, you have the uh, text? This is a little bit lengthy, so I, I, I thought I had all my uh, posts on his Facebook account on here, but uh, I do have, when you are accepted onto this Facebook account that is his Senator Jason Rapert account, you have the opportunity to engage with him personally on a one-to-one -one level. So I do have, this is, after this communication is when he blocked me. So that's why it's more significant to me yeah. anyway. Uh, he wrote, our nation is already based upon Judeo-Christian principles and ideals. I want the history and heritage of our nation to be honored and the U.S. Constitution to be respected. Those trying to whitewash God from the public square in our nation, in our nation dishonor the will and history of our founding fathers. Smart people recognize that while we would never demand people adhere to a particular faith, our nation has always embraced God and sought his blessings for our people. Why would you or anyone else demand we deny a fundamental part of who we are? I have seen your posts and I know you are an atheist. <laughs> All right, well, that, that, that is your right. You must also respect the rights and values of the majority of people. Now, I wrote back to him. Thank you for your quick response. I also want the history and heritage of our nation to be honored and the U.S. Constitution to be respected. Perhaps you're aware of something I'm not, but nowhere in the Constitution does it mention God. And it only mentions religion to maintain that the government shall make no law respecting a religion. That hasn't stopped the Christian right wing from infiltrating our government and sending my hard-earned tax dollars meant to support our country over to various religions. That is unjust. And then I say, 
I respect good Christians, but not ones that want to start religious wars by claiming people who don't think as they do are an enemy. We are not the enemy, but then it is only by your saying so that we are. Our tolerance is far greater than yours, as we must be patient and loving to many people who do not share our philosophy. In fact, we are more Christian in our behavior than the argumentative, accusatory, mean-spirited people who call themselves Christians. I love, <laughs> I love Arkansas. When I'm told to have a blessed day, I'm delighted because that person is wishing me well. Why would they curse me out if they knew I would, would they curse me out if they knew I wasn't one of them? You were elected in your district, but you now sit in the Senate and represent us all. Be more gentle, more kind, more open to allowing all people to live good, happy, free, productive lives. We are not the enemy. Your fear and hatred are the enemy. The Founding Fathers recognized the pitfalls of a government based on religion, any religion. Some of them were Christian and some of them were secular. It is not their beliefs that survive, but the Constitution, wherein we are all equal and religion should never infiltrate our government. <laughs> If religion infiltrates and runs government, you get an Afghanistan and Iran and other examples where people are subjugated to the entire religious book of that faith. Surely you have read your Bible as I have and found that therein are many word of God laws that are as brutal as Islamic laws. Stone your children who disobey you. Uh, never beat your slaves to death, only until they're bedridden. The extreme Christian Taliban would have these enacted. Surely you can see that the peace and love preached by Jesus would be overrun with the negative, horrible aspects also in the word of God. Please refrain from dictating your personal religious beliefs into our secular government. And, and then I was blocked. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, I didn't curse, I wasn't rude, I wasn't mean-spirited, but I was direct. Yep. And, and let's piggyback on the analogy that Jeff was just talking about in his last speech. If Sen Senator Rapert held a town hall and got up in front of the audience and said, I'm going to take questions from my constituents, I'm going to take questions from the public, and you had politely, you know, politely walked up to the microphone and said that. He couldn't say, throw her out of here. He couldn't shut you down, right? It just so happens we're moving into a new age in which fewer and fewer political operatives are communicating in a space like this and more communicating over social media. So I, I loved that. Uh, I, I wanted you to go through because I thought that was a really good uh, way to illustrate the kind of activism and the kind of respectful dialogue that, that we're talking about. Um, so now, Senator Rapert blocks you on Twitter, uh, on Facebook. W what do you do next? I was fortunate that Allison Gill had sent out an email to the uh, some people in Arkansas because apparently, and I was unaware of this, there's an entire Facebook page of people who have been blocked by Senator Rapert. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. And uh, she asked if we had taken screenshots of, uh, and asked, would you take screenshots also? So I did. I, I went back and I took screenshots because this was before I was blocked. And as a function of that, I sent them in and they asked me, uh, would I be willing to be a plaintiff in this case? And I said, yes. And what do you want? Right? You're the, you're the plaintiff. What do I want? Yeah. What, what do oh. you want the court to do? Senator, the last time I looked at his page, which since I've been blocked, I really have no interest in reading his religious nonsense. <laughs> so, but the last time I checked, there were over 23,000 people who subscribed to that page. What I want is for there to be me and another hundred people or more 
with varying points of view for these people to be exposed to and begin to learn and educate themselves. If you listen to Anthony Magnabosco's uh, talk the other day, I want to be a pebble in their shoe. I don't want to change their mind. I don't want to convert them. I want to initiate a conversation in which they become more and more aware of people that are not like them. So why don't, why don't we hear a little bit from Robert, and then I want to talk about the transition from uh, having this action take place to filing the lawsuit, and then we can get, I, I'll try and stay out of the legal geekery too much, but, uh, but we'll, we'll delve into it. So Robert, what, what's, your, what's your story? Uh, well, I, <clears throat> I moved back to Arkansas from Alaska, and when I got there, unfortunately, I found out that Senator Rapert represented me, and I had heard of him when I was in Alaska when he made the comments about, let's not let the, these minorities run roughshod over our rights. And so I sought him out on Facebook, and you know, his senator page anyways, and, and began engaging with people on there. I think the first thing I really started engaging in was when he was talking about getting prayers back in school. And it, it, he was presenting it in, in an extremely deceptive manner so that his people that followed him would not realize what their rights were. So I began explaining to people what their rights were with concerning their children and religion in school. And I kept telling them, you know, you need to teach your kid to be a leader, have them pray in school, have them bring their Bible to school, blah, blah, blah. That was all good, that didn't get me blocked. But at some point he posted uh, something anti-abortion and so I responded with, something about don't believe it when Christians tell you that the Bible is against abortion and then I linked the test of an unfaithful wife and then I was no longer able to post on his page or react to any of his comments pretty quickly um, and occasionally I go back to look to see what he's posting but it, it is upsetting that I can't continue to engage really what I like doing is engaging with the people that follow him it is really hilarious when he decides to respond and, and try to have a discussion but it's, it's more important to me to try to communicate with the people because he is misleading them and I want to, you know, let them know where he's wrong. And, and so after you were blocked, same process? Did you find out about the uh, Facebook group of yeah, folks who've I, been blocked? I pretty quickly joined the uh, Arkansans against Jason Rapert page and had a lot of fun over there and, <laughs> and uh, got to, you know, people would post what their comments were. Oh yeah, and I... I recognize that trolls will delete their own comments and trolls will block you. So you should always screenshot trolls. He is a troll. So I, I didn't take that into account when I was first commenting on his page, but now I know when I <laughs> screenshot it. Uh, but uh, so it was quite a while before I saw somebody um, bring up the American Atheist uh, lawsuit and so I jumped on that as soon as I heard about it and found out about it. Uh, it and I was very glad to be able to participate in it. I mean I was a little apprehensive about getting my uh, name out there in public like that in certain ways but um, especially considering he is called the bully of Bigelow and there are reasons. So let's talk about that a little bit right I think I think that's a that's a really excellent uh, segue for folks like Jeff and I, filing a lawsuit is part of what we do. What's it like being a plaintiff in a lawsuit? Right? How's, how's that experience been for you? For me? Yeah, for both of you. Well, for me so far, it's been a lot of fun. I mean, nothing, <laughs> no bad consequences have happened yet. I mean, like I, I, I talked with my ex-wife about, you know, I'm going to be doing something uh, kind of activist here pretty soon, and there may be consequences. I mean, we're talking about a senator here who when, when a constituent approached him in a Lowe's parking lot to talk to him, he later tweeted about it and was hashtag armed and ready. And so uh, if he is that nutbaggy, I was really concerned about how nutbaggy his constituents would be. So I let her know that, look, there may be some times where I need you to have the kids at your house, even though it's my time to have the kids. So be aware and then about two weeks later the news release came out and she's like she sent me a text is like is this it i'm like yep that's it <laughs> and karen what about you participating in this lawsuit it has been dependent on the stage of life that i am in i 
I'm from New Jersey, but even in New Jersey, I did not want to come out as an outspoken atheist while my children were in school. I did not want my children to suffer repercussions for my personal philosophy. And I did want my children to grow and decide for themselves what philosophy they would follow. So I have been a closet, more or less. And then as my children grew up and left the house, I started participating in local atheist groups. When I moved to Arkansas five years ago, I sought out the local atheist groups. And um, now I feel that they can't do anything to me. I mean, I do understand that people in the South, I, I can't even begin to tell you, if you have never spent any time in the South, it is such a different culture. It is such a different society. It is so expected that you are Christian that they don't say, what's your background? They say, where do you go to church? Where's, you know, you're welcome to the neighborhood. Where do you go to church? And you're like, so it's a very strange society to me. It's a very strange incorporating myself into that society. And so having an opportunity to come out on this lawsuit really had a lot to do with the fact that I have nothing to lose. So I understand that people want to participate, they might want to be in this lawsuit, and they couldn't because of the repercussions of living in that society right now and wanting to protect their family or wanting to protect their children, as Robert said. So participating in the lawsuit is a piece of cake. I'm working with wonderful people. It's like, show up here, sign here, answer the questions. It's easy. We do, we do make sure you read what you sign before yeah. you sign it. I just want, <laughs> just want to make that point. Well, yeah, and let's, and let's bring in Jeff now at this point. So you've got Karen and Robert. Oh, go, Robert, go ahead. I, I would sure. like to add something else. Uh, on the bully Bigelow point, there's some other issues. Like, he will call your employer. He will try to shut down your small business. He will publicly call for a boycott on his senator page. Luckily, I'm an Uber driver, and there's nothing he can do. I mean, worst case <laughs> scenario, he gives me a one-star rating. So... That's another thing. I felt very protected by that, and so yeah. I could jump on this. Now, yeah. No, and I and I, and I I think for me the the takeaway there. This is something you've heard all weekend. When you're in a position to be an activist, engage. Right. Take advantage of that because there are folks who are not in that position. And if you're not, if you can't, right. We understand. That's that's why folks are are ready to do the heavy lifting and ready to have their name in the caption of a lawsuit. And that, that brings us to Mr. Blackwell. And, and I wanna say right up front, even if, you know, uh, in, in this instance, American Atheist is itself a plaintiff in this case, um, in its capacity as an organization that represents many people across Arkansas. We have dozens of people who came forward to us saying, I've been blocked. And here's, you know, here's screenshots, here's this, but I don't, I, my name can't be out there. And so they are, there are opportunities to participate and to assist that don't require you to have your name on a lawsuit for posterity. I want to point that out right up front. Um, yeah. So, so Raul, go, go ahead, please. I want you to know there are four plaintiffs. Two of them were not able to make it here. And what I love about all the plaintiffs is that we're, very, we're in very different stages of our life. We are very different in our ages. And uh, so it's a wonderful cross-section. It's not like, we're all truck drivers and you blocked us. Do you know, there's a variety of human beings of these four people, and, and I think that is actually healthy in this case. So, Jeff, you had four people come to you. How, how many total potential plaintiffs did you have come to you? Because I suspect what Karen just said, uh, that, that that selection of the named plaintiffs did not occur by accident. So. It, it, did, it did not. I mean, we didn't, uh, I wasn't consciously thinking, well, we want a diverse range of people. Um, but we, so the, uh, I, let me answer your question very briefly first, that I, I didn't go check how many people in total uh, contacted us um, before the convention. I can say that it's a, it, it was a couple dozen. It was a couple, couple dozen who contacted us. I don't have the exact number. Um, but, uh, you know, 
back in about this time actually last year, we had three people totally independently contact us saying they had been blocked by this guy in Arkansas. And we were peripherally aware of him because he put the Ten Commandments monument on the Arkansas Capitol grounds um, and had engaged in a number of other things. Um, but so a few people came to us and um, so when you have three people who are all saying that this is happening, um, we decided to uh, do two things. First, find out if there were others, um, and second, um, verify that it was um, really going on. Um, you always want to do your fact checking ahead of time, and, and so you know, we asked for our activists in the area, hey, engage with this guy and let us know what happens. And Karen um, <laughs> graciously obliged, and, and um, we found out that, yeah, this is totally happening. <laughs> um, um, and so we contacted the Facebook pages and, and um, people in his, in his district and other constituents across Arkansas and um, were contacted by a bunch of people. And, and uh, the way we decided which, plain, which people uh, would serve as plaintiffs was one, are they willing? Two, is there documentation? Um, and three, if there's, if there's not documentation, is there enough to you know, make the factual allegations necessary so that we could get the documentation at a later stage? Um, and uh, through that process, we, we had uh, Karen, Robert, um, Kathy, and uh, Betty Jo. So I, I summarized the thesis of your lawsuit as uh, drawing an analogy, using that language from your talk of limited use public forum, saying essentially that uh, Senator Raypert's official uh, Facebook page is the equivalent of a town hall, right? Is that number one, f at a high level summary, is that a fair characterization of the case? In, I think absolutely. Mind? He certainly uses it that way. Right. So, so now let me push that a little bit. Suppose Karen runs for public office, right? And as a result, people start trolling her page and they post Christian memes. Every time she says something, somebody gets on and says, well, God bless you and, you know, and, and respectfully, uh, but takes every conversation to, uh, I could never vote for Karen, she's an atheist, you need to know she's an atheist. Uh, are you, are you okay with saying Karen's got to keep those comments up on her Facebook page? If she's running for office? Yes. Uh, she can remove those, page, those comments if she wants before she has, before she's a public official, she's a private citizen and right. can do what she wants. And I'm pretty sure we have a couple of people in the audience, or we did earlier, who have run for office. I don't know if Aaron or Gail are still here, um, but I imagine that there are people, who, at least at the convention, who have encountered that very situation. Well, you can, you can tell the lawyer on the panel, because I think you anticipated the next question I was going to ask, which is, okay, she moderates her page while she's running for office, now she wins. The same trolls come back. Does she have to let them continue to be on her Facebook page? So, that is an interesting question. And it depends on what she started using that page for once she was elected. If she maintains that page as what it was, a campaign page, then yes. Um, but she has to actually do that. She has to maintain it as her, you know, um, as her I'm potentially going to be a candidate in the future if you want to donate to my campaign, if you want to see my campaign website, here it is, um, then that, isn't, that would not, to my reading, be a public forum because she's not intending it to be a way to contact her in her capacity as your government official. Now, if she gets elected and she starts a separate page, that's her you know, Karen Dempsey 2020 page, and keeps this one and says, hey, I want to, you know, um, I now represent, um, uh, I don't know what district you actually live in, but I want to I contact the, um, the, the, the voters in my district and, and let me know what's important to you because I can bring that to the state capitol. Then guess what? That's, that's now you um, acting as a, as a state lawmaker. That's you um, doing what is an integral part of your job, and then yes, that becomes a public forum. And, and she's got to politely listen and allow the uh, spam bots to uh, to post 
the, yeah. the, the, the opposite message on her what, what she can do, she is under no obligation to listen. She can mute a person, which means that person, particularly on Facebook, can still participate in the discussion, but Karen just doesn't see them. And, and if Senator and, and That's Rayford, per perfectly yeah. reasonable. There's no constitutional violation there if, you know, if I as a lawmaker just want to throw away Karen's mail, you know, I guess that's my prerogative. <laughs> and, um, and so if Senator Rapert had done that, if he had muted rather than blocked, rather than deleting comments, this wouldn't be a lawsuit, right? Yes, except. <laughs> uh, lawyers. Indeed. Um, except for the instance I showed of him attacking somebody for the viewpoint that they expressed. That still has a chilling effect on speech and I believe would be um, still actionable censorship if he had not blocked or deleted Adam Valentine's comments. So I, that, that actually gets into the, the next issue that I wanted to talk about. You mentioned the Davison versus Randall case. That was the Fourth Circuit case you were talking about yes. in your last presentation. And the concurrence in that opinion raises what I think is a really interesting question to, to grapple with. And that is um, the government may create a limited use public forum in the manner that you've talked about, right? By using social media as a means of communicating with their constituents. And the government may not discriminate on the basis of viewpoint in a limited use public forum. The law on that is super clear, as you pointed out. So you cannot say what Rapert has said. I'm going to ban atheists from being on my page. That's a viewpoint the government can't discriminate. He has made public statements in which he says that we, he and I don't know who else, maintain a watch list of people to block. Yep. That's a great way to get yourself sued for a First Amendment violation, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> so, but the question raised by that concurrence that I thought was really interesting, and I'd love to get all of your opinion on it, is Facebook and Twitter social media platforms maintain their own internal codes, and those codes may be more restrictive than the First Amendment. In other words, Facebook may pull a post down for being hate speech, even though that would not be, the government couldn't, couldn't uh, censor on the basis of hate speech particular viewpoints, right? Um, so how does that play in in this environment? Suppose you have an official public page, it's an official public forum because you win this lawsuit, uh, and then the law is now clear that uh, a government page on Twitter counts as a public forum. Now, Twitter starts removing comments. What happens? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I'll go ahead. We're getting, the well, lawyer is getting coached my here by the witness. Moment, so. <laughs> I don't participate on Twitter. Yeah. I don't like it. Or Facebook as well. I okay, mean, I'm sorry. But either, either one, right? So suppose, so the question is, suppose that the private social media company starts censoring, removing posts, uh, but it's not the public official that's doing it. Well, it, I don't know what Facebook considers hate speech because I was recently in, in the uh, Arkansans against Senator Rapert page, somebody posted pictures of a pretty heinous comment, a couple of pretty heinous comments. A man uh, on uh, Senator Rapert's page was talking about um, Islam is a virus that must all be destroyed and wiped off the face of the earth. And then their next comment was, we need to start burning down mosques now. And so I reported those comments to Facebook, but that's not hate speech. And it also did not upset Senator Rapert enough for him to delete that comment. So the, the, that kind of speech is apparently okay. I try to look at the bigger picture and play within the rules in order to get my point across. So if hate speech is clearly defined, then I'm going to abide by the rules of hate speech. I knew once I started participating on Je uh, Senator Jason Rapert's page that I was not going to use profanity. I was not going to attack him personally. I was not going to do anything that would normally have a person blocked from a public forum. I did not stand in the room and curse profanities or call people names or um, undermine their status, their position, their points of view so much as I wanted to present my points of view. So I try to play within the rules. 
I want to win. I'm not here for the battle. I'm here for the war. Love that. Um, it, as far as, well, Facebook, of course, is a private entity, and they are allowed, uh, and um, I would encourage them to put um, appropriate um, mechanisms in place to um, curate their platform, um, and that they're entirely within their rights to do that. And if Facebook feels that a, a comment is um, a violation of the terms of use for that user, um, that is um, Facebook's prerogative. Um, and wouldn't be grounds for a lawsuit against the government official. Um, but I can also see someone developing a social media platform um, which is, um, which has access mechanisms in place that are um, far more troubling than Facebook's. That could really be, a, a, wherein if a government official were to open up a, a, a government controlled account on that social media platform, it would raise potential First Amendment concerns. But um, that's sort of, to be able to weigh in on that in hypothetical yeah, yeah. Is, is difficult. Um, as long as I think the platform is, is using neutral rules um, uh, and the government official, especially when it's a platform like Facebook where just everybody is on it, um, why wouldn't a government official use, use that as a way to communicate with their constituents? Right. Um, but I also want to kind of uh, liken the hypothetical to when a church serves as a polling place. They're not allowed to proselytize. They're not allowed to, um, you know. You, you, to, you could put scare quotes around that when you do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, seriously, how many people have seen a polling place uh, that has uh, flagrantly violated that, that rule when you go to vote? Yeah. <laughs> I worked. I worked technical uh, su uh, technical support for my county clerk like 15 years ago now, uh, and um, one of the places where I had to service the um, electronic voting booths was in a church. Yeah. And they don't. They they in particular did not take any steps um, to uh, limit the religious content that you encounter. Right. Um, ironically, uh, Trinity Lutheran Church in Columbia, Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish we could delve into that. I really want to uh, get, get to uh, some questions from the audience, but, but, but before we do that, um, give us uh, a kind of a quick summary. You filed the case in January. Where do we stand now, and what's your assessment? I, I do want to make a mild correction. We filed an initial complaint in October, but then we hit a legalistic snag and refiled it in January. Okay. So. I just want to make so sure. So I was looking at the caption. So yes, <laughs> yes, uh, of course. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we were being totally <laughs> correct in there. Um, so can you repeat your question? So oh, I forgot. Uh, the, the amended complaint, the second complaint, was filed in early January. Um, it's three months later. Where, where do we stand in terms of the litigation? Certainly. And what are you looking for? What's your assessment of where the case is going? So right now, we are waiting on two decisions from the judge in our case, uh, Judge Baker from the Eastern District of Arkansas. Um, in conjunction with filing our um, second complaint in January, we filed a motion for a temporary restraining order and a preliminary injunction. Basically, what we were asking, what we were asking the court to do there is, um, since we are likely to prevail at the end of the case, and it is a case of, uh, it is a constitutional rights issue of some importance, that you should go ahead and order Raybert at the beginning of the case to unblock our plaintiffs um, so that they can participate in public discourse and that kind of thing um, now, and rather than wait two, three years for the process of litigation to work its way out. Um, we're waiting for the courts to make a decision on that. Jason Raybert has also filed a motion to dismiss the, so <laughs> I'm gonna get into legalese. We sued Jason Raybert in, in his official capacity and in his individual capacity. And, and there are reasons for that. Um, because certain, certain remedies that the court can impose apply to people differently in different capacities. So his personal attorney filed a motion to dismiss the claims we filed against him in his individual capacity. No motion to dismiss has been filed against 
uh, to, has been filed for the claims brought against him in his official capacity by the Attorney General of Arkansas. Well, and, and in fact, he's answered the complaint in his official yes. capacity. Yes, yes. And significance for the audience, if you answer the complaint, that means you've given up your right to move to dismiss. You are saying this is potentially, this is on face, a meritorious lawsuit, right? It's not objectively crazy. Right. It right. doesn't mean you agree, right? but it does mean that you agree that if this is true, that this is actionable. Right. Which is, um, uh, he is very fond of saying that our lawsuit is entirely frivolous and we will be thrown out of court in, um, you know, any day now. Uh, no, we won't. He already and has, actually. <laughs> you know, when you, we filed in October and then when, when they... Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was yeah. saying, oh, well, that, that's done and it's over and, and we won. Yeah. No, no. We just had to refile <laughs> our paperwork. Um, Jeff, I have a question for you. Does, sure. it, uh, does the presence and the representation by the Arkansas State Attorney General's office have any bearing on that it's an official page? No. Um, that's an excellent question because it comes up a lot. Um, the laws of the state of Arkansas mandate that the Attorney General must defend any lawsuit brought against a state official in their official capacity. We could have sued him over stealing a ham sandwich in his official capacity, and the Attorney General would have been obligated to defend him in that case. It doesn't have any bearing on whether or not his Facebook page and Twitter accounts uh, from which he was blocking people are uh, public forums. So let's, uh, if we have some questions out here from the audience. And do we have another mic no. to circulate around? Yes. Allison, do you have a question or are you? Oh, okay. That's going to put this me is on the not a This is not a planned canned question. <laughs> <laughs> never, never want your boss to be like, hey. <laughs> Where were you on Friday? <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of a planned question. So. Who are the wonderful local attorneys in this case that we are uh, working with? You know, the, the wonderful local attorneys in Arkansas, so who are they? Yes, I am not the only attorney working on this case. That is important and something that I wanted to highlight, and I'm sorry that um, I needed prompting. Um, so we are working with a, a great team of lawyers uh, down in Little Rock from Williams and Anderson, um, and uh, particularly Phil Kaplan. Um, he has a, a great team of lawyers there. Um, they do a lot of First Amendment work. They represent uh, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, I believe. Um, they work in the First Amendment um, world a lot, and we're, we're incredibly thankful to have uh, their help in this case. Did, did you have a pre-existing relationship with that firm? Had you reached out to them before, or how did you connect up with lawyers willing to sign their name as counsel for American atheists, which sure know, sometimes a challenge. It, it is. It is um, uh, very often a challenge. Unfortunately, um, we got in touch with him because I contacted um, a gentleman who, <clears throat> whose name escapes me right now, but who uh, used to be president of the Arkansas chapter of the ACLU. And I said, you know, would you be interested in handling our case? And if not, can you recommend somebody? And he said, well, I used to work with your judge, so I am. I, am, I would love to take your case, but I'm conflicted. I, my rules, the rules of professional responsibility would mean if I take your case, you lose your judge, um, which throws a whole wrench into litigation. That, that's lots of fun. Um, but he said, I know a guy who is great at this stuff. Uh, get in touch with Phil Kaplan. And we did, and it has completely paid off. So let me ask you about Judge Baker in the case. You didn't, you didn't want to lose that judge. What's your assessment? One of the things lawyers do is you figure out who your case is in front of and you read up on the judge's decision, I, I, uh, past decisions. I, I know you've done that. What, what's your assessment of Judge Baker? Um, I have uh, been in her courtroom one time and she was um, a very, very thoughtful jurist. Um, we knew when we were assigned to her um, that uh, she's an Obama appointee, so um, uh, while we think that our case is, is rock solid, we, by the way, um, I also, in addition to giving Phil Kaplan credit, we um, had some extensive conversations with the Columbia University Knight First Amendment Institute, who are the lawyers behind the lawsuit against Trump over his Twitter account. Um, and um, they, uh, I, I, this isn't the kind of thing that you would necessarily need to ask permission for, but I asked, hey, you know, can we um, 
uh, borrow the structure of your complaints um, to use in our lawsuit. And so we're, we're standing on the so shoulders of a lot of giants, so I, I, I don't want to discount um, their presence. Um, so, which is a long way of me saying we have an incredibly solid case, but you do want to have um, a judge that you think will be receptive. Um, we have plenty of cases where because of a judge's personal views, they might be hostile. Yeah. Now, I don't know Judge Baker's religious point of view or anything like that, um, but I um, have a feeling that a, an Obama-appointed judge will know the law backwards and forwards, um, isn't necessarily from the Federalist Society or something like that. Um, and so um, we were happy with her when we were first assigned her, and we did not want to lose her. Understood. Oh yeah, the Knight First Amendment uh, uh, Institute um, won at the trial level in their in their Trump case, which is why I was very eager to um, steal their methodology. Essentially, <laughs> <laughs> are there any other questions out there from the audience? I see. Yeah, oh, right oh, well, oh, I'll let, sorry. Let's let Andrew moderate. <laughs> nope. <laughs> All right. Thanks there you go. Yes, I'm one of the nine plaintiffs with American Atheists on a prior suit, the Kentucky Homeland Security lawsuit, and I'm wondering if there's a possibility that it could be refiled at the uh, 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 national in the national courts rather than in the state courts. And we can take this offline if you need to. Sure. Um, I would love to talk more with you. Um, that was before I came on, so I don't know the facts of that case or how it was eventually disposed. Um, there's the possibility that, uh, that depending on how the, how the case wound up, we would not be able to. Um, there's also, given that it was before my time and I've been here for two and a half years, um, there, there's a strong possibility that the statute of limitations is run. Now, that's without really having the facts to hand at all. So I'd be happy to talk with you more afterward, yes. What's your name? Okay. Hi guys, um, so my main question is, I'm noticing that um, people are framing these quote unquote religious discrimination lawsuits based on their what they perceive to be their First Amendment right being infringed upon. And I was wondering how do we counter that particular line of reasoning when someone says, well, you're violating my rights, because I don't believe truly that there is any violation going on when you're talking about making one group equal to another. Yeah, yeah uh, that's, that, that's an awesome question, and you might, I'm, I'm gonna prompt you a little bit on uh, count five in your complaint. You might wanna sort of talk a little bit about the jujitsu move there. Sure. Um, so first let me say um, that uh, they are, they are wrong. <laughs> religious, religious liberty is not a license to discriminate. I, it, was anybody here at the rally? Okay, so a number of you saw my speech, may not have been paying attention, that's fine, I don't judge. Um, <laughs> um, but the, the concept of liberty um, is very amorphous, but the, the idea that crystallizes it best for me is that my liberty to swing my fist ends at the tip of your nose. And what that means is you can't use liberty as a means to harm someone else. And that's exactly what these cases are doing. Um, now, I'm going to have to, I, in the moment, refresh my memory on what um, count five says. Um, come on. Oh, my, my tablet fell asleep. That's the, it's the riffer. Oh, that's the riffer claim. Yeah. Yeah. I, th th this was, I thought that was a great question. You set up for something that I had wanted to ask. So I'm using my moderator privileges to ask a question I'm really curious about. Sure. Um, so RIFRA, the, uh, okay, I'm going to do another poll. Uh, who's heard of RIFRA? Yeah, okay. Um, RIFRA, R-F-R-A, is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. There's a federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act passed uh, in 1993 um, in the wake of a decision called Employment Division v. Smith, um, in which Justice Scalia said any law uh, of general applicability that incidentally burdens someone's religious exercise is not a violation of the Free Exercise Clause. Um, People, and by the way, I think Justice Scalia was entirely right, um, and you're not gonna hear me say that very frequently, um, but he was. 
um, because your personal religious beliefs cannot be a license to violate the law. Um, if taken to its absolutely logical extent, um, that would mean every person is subject to different laws because of what they claim to be sincerely held beliefs. Because by the way, the courts will not say, your, your belief is not sincerely held. Um, so what Congress did was say, um, no, no, no. Um, we are going to include in the definitions um, statute in federal law that um, essentially every law has read into it an exception for people's sincerely held religious beliefs, taking us back to a, an, earlier law, uh, an earlier decision called Sherbert v. Verner. Um, and what that meant was that um, if a law uh, burdens a sincerely held belief, you can use RIFRA as a defense to a lawsuit brought against you or as a challenge to that particular law as a plaintiff. They tried to apply this to the states. Uh, they tried to say that this applied to all federal and state laws, and the court said, no, Congress, you can govern federal law, but if states want to do this, they have to do it themselves. And as a result, a bunch of states did it themselves, um, including Arkansas. Now, atheists and the non-believer community broadly don't hate to say that this is a religion, because it isn't. There's no, you know, you can, it's an answer to a single question. However, in the context of the law, non-belief is viewed as, a, as on the same level as religious belief. Now, what we did in this case is say that um, you are, by blocking someone, burdening their right to exercise their atheism, their right to educate the people as to the facts, their right to do exactly what both of our plaintiffs have said, to engage with our fellow citizens, with our government officials, and say, hey, I don't want your religious beliefs imposed on me, your religious beliefs should not be imposed on everyone, um, and that by doing that, you are burdening our free exercise of our beliefs. Um, and apparently, I guess, the Attorney General's office thinks that's at least credible, which is good to hear. Um, and yeah, I'm interested to see how it comes out. I imagine there are, um, this, a case, this case is going to take years before it's done because it will be appealed at a number of levels. I'm waiting on a decision from the judge on our motion for a preliminary injunction. And the judge is likely to say he has to unblock our plaintiffs. Um, immediately, the, the Arkansas Attorney General's office, we expect, will appeal that decision. And so the case will pause and we'll appeal that decision and that will take a year um, depending on the court's calendar, who the heck knows. Um, and then when we reach a final decision, unless we settle with the state of Arkansas on this, with the Arkansas Attorney General's office, um, the final decision will likely be appealed. Um, so I am, I'm very curious to see how it comes out. I hope that I um, am, you know, five or six years from now still doing this job, which is my dream job. Um, me too. And please, please donate to American Atheists so I can continue doing my dream job. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, so we've got yep. three minutes, so time for probably two more questions. Oh, okay. Um, so just, if, if, if we get to you, just please keep your questions brief so we can get to as many as we can. Todd mentioned earlier today that Senator Raper would go to his uh, place of work uh, or to other places to try and get him harmed because of uh, his beliefs. What can be done to, to make this man uh, pay for uh, doing things like this, like damages to the individual's income, things like that? Um, there are uh, causes of action that might be able to be brought against him if he's interfering in a contractual relationship and that kind of thing. Um, the best remedy is to uh, get him out of office. Um, <laughs> Again, if you, if, if you live in Arkansas's 35th Senate District, um, pay attention. I'm not going to say anything more like that. <laughs> Probably the last one here. Yeah, last question. 
So in the event that, that he does leave office, uh, or what's the likelihood that he'll be out of office at any point in the near future, and how would that impact the case? And do we want that, or do we want this to set a precedent? Did, did, did you hear that question? I, I missed so the beginning. The, I heard the, set a the precedent. The question is, right, you've described that this is going to be a lengthy process. What if Senator Rapert is out of office in the next election cycle, how does that affect the case? Would that be a good outcome, or would you prefer that, you know, it's set, that the case set a precedent? I'll let you take it. Sure. So if he's voted Great out question. of office, a number of our um, requested remedies will be rendered moot. Um, basically, there are um, certain things you have to, um, uh, certain things that have to be true about your claim in order for a court to hear it, and one is that the court has the, uh, that, that anything that the court might do would um, change the situation, um, it, meaning it has to be something that's uh, remediable um, uh, by the court. And if he's out of office, then he's no longer operating a government Facebook page and the court can't order him to unblock someone from his um, non-government controlled Facebook page. Now. But, um, but I think you'd take that victory, right? Oh, we would, we would take the victory, um, certainly. We also bring a claim for nominal damages and punitive damages because he knowingly violated a bunch of people's First Amendment rights. Um, nominal damages are when you haven't necessarily lost actual money, but in an acknowledgement that you were wrong, the court orders the defendant to pay you one dollar. That's nominal damages. Um, so we've asked for nominal damages and we've asked for punitive damages. And if the court, um, if our case, the court decides, meets the requirements for punitive damages, um, those claims would continue even after he um, uh, leaves office. And, and, and the distinction there is that the types of damages that Jeff just talked about are for the past conduct that's already occurred. The injunctive relief is for future and continuing conduct on the page. So if he's no longer in office, he's no longer maintaining a government page, that part of the lawsuit goes away, but the past aspect of the lawsuit would still be intact. Can I just, uh, very briefly, I want to I want to touch on another aspect of that. Um, he could t today unblock all of our plaintiffs, um, and that would not matter. Um, he would, we would still continue and, and seek a court order directing him that he can't um, block them in the future because um, the the courts it, when when a defendant takes an action that is um, uh, easily revoked um, in order to make a case go away they will not dismiss the case on those grounds um, the the specific language is escaping me uh, easily re easily <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, capable, yeah, easily evaded and capable of uh, yeah, capable of evading review. Um, I, I would, if if Callie will give me uh, one more minute. What I would love to end with is for Karen and Rob to just kind of give us thirty seconds of advice from your experience from this in terms of being active, how to get engaged, and how to bring about meaningful social change. Jeff did such a brilliant presentation on. Uh, being active and engaging with your public servants. And I would highly recommend that you do that. The other thing is, is last year I put my money where my mouth is and I became a life member of American Atheists. So I strongly, <laughs> strongly support people go ahead and, and become a life member. It, it's worth it. And you have a lot more life than I have left, so no. <laughs> You'll be around for a long time. Yeah. Uh, I hadn't really heard of the engage thing until he, you know, brought it up. But for the most part, I was kind of following the rules already. Other than I really like to cuss sometimes. I'm a bad kid, <laughs> and uh, I used to be a lot more firebrand online. But you know, I've kind of stopped being firebrandy. I'm not really sure why, which you know, kind of does follow the, the engage guidelines there, um, and it's kind of a fun game for me trying to get people lead people around where they need to go sometimes in a intellectual aspect so um, the fact that it's a hobby and it's something that American Atheist recommends they line up real nice 
All right, well, Karen, Rob, I, I really want to thank you for being up here on the panel and sharing your experiences. And Jeff, I want to thank you, not just for being on the panel, but for your amazing work in uh, crafting a lawsuit. And uh, uh, it's, it's uh, you, can, you can go out, I think we're gonna make, I'll, I, I'm gonna link at least off of my page uh, how to get to the complaint, uh, because if you're the kind of person that likes to read legal complaints, you should read this one, it's really well done. So, thank you. Everybody, thank you. I'm, I love doing the work. So. Thank you all so much.